Hi, I'm Daniel Roberts, and you are listening to the Giving Town Podcast, where we share stories of hope and generosity in our wonderful community of Newburgh, Oregon, and the surrounding area. This podcast is sponsored by my real estate team, the Joyful Roberts Group, and we are licensed real estate brokers with Premier Property Group, LLC. We're passionate about serving our clients well and educating people about the many aspects of real estate. So if that's something you're interested in, you can check out our YouTube channel, which is linked in the description below. In today's episode, I'm interviewing Newburgh City Manager, Will Worthy. Will originally came to Newburgh to be the library director, but through a series of events, found himself as the city manager. We'll be talking about Will's early career, how he ended up in Newburgh, his accomplishments as the library director, and of course, how he ended up becoming the city manager and what that journey has been like. I have the deepest respect for Will, and after listening to this episode, I think you will too. Well, hey everyone, I'm here with Will Worthy, the Newburgh City Manager. Will, thank you so much for taking the time to come and do this episode with me. You're very welcome, me. Glad to be here. You know, it's funny. It's, well, maybe not funny. Is, maybe that's not the right word, but there are a lot of interesting circumstances, a lot of interesting scenarios that played out for you to be here. Obviously, now you're the City Manager, but that's uh, not really the reason that you originally came to Newburgh. You're your hope was always to be a librarian. Um, and I don't know, I think some people know that people who before the pandemic, it was short. I mean, what time did you, did you come to do where I'm trying to remember? So actually, I mean, I was in librarianship for my whole career, start really from being a teenager, but I arrived here in Newburgh in July of 2019. So basically you had about a half year to, to get so many things planned and processes implemented. And then, um, shortly after. Um, it seems shortly after is kind of when you took on this role. So I want to back up a little bit from city manager and just talk about your background because you have a, a long history of being a librarian. So what from maybe from being a, a child, what drew you to being a librarian in the first place? So I, I've been really blessed and I'm really lucky in the sense that I always knew exactly what it was I wanted to do with my life. And most people that I've met, haven't had that luck. They've had to kind of search around a bit or try out different jobs or roles before they find something. But when I was a kid, starting from 14 or 15 years of age, I was absolutely certain that I wanted to spend my whole life being a public librarian. And then when I dug into it a little bit deeper, I knew I wanted to be a children's librarian. And so that kind of came to me pretty clearly just from feeling that when I went to the library myself as a kid and it was by myself because there was not really anyone taking me to the library yeah that was a safe space for me to be in and it was a place where there were friendly receptive helpful adults who would do stuff for me and they didn't want anything from me they just wanted to help me and so I thought if I could be one of those people that would be the most amazing thing in the world, and it was. So what was your career history of being a librarian? How did you first take that step? So the very first thing I did in terms of anything at all was volunteering in the library. So I was a volunteer teenage shelver, and then I got a paid shelving position, and that was at Dumbarton Public Library in Scotland, which some people might not know, but Carnegie built libraries on both sides of the pond. So you always have about five pieces in Scotland. Can you, and can you quickly share about the, um, and you say it's not Carnegie, it's Grenady. It's <laughs> a bit of a yeah. way of, of pronouncing it. Um, can you share, because some people I think are not aware of, of that program. So just kind of a quick. Sure. So what was that? So there was, there was an industrialist and he was involved in partly in railways and iron and steel and heavy industry. And he made a tremendous fortune during the late 19th century, the Gilded Age, as it's called sometimes. But unlike some of these tycoons, he actually had a moral pang about the great wealth he had amassed and decided that he would redistribute it towards the end of his life and after his life and that a good philanthropist, a good person, should not leave the, the piggy bank full at the end and it should all be redistributed. So he decided that the best thing for the common good would be libraries. And so he set up a, an endowment and a trust, and it still runs today, 
the creative libraries all over this country and in many other countries. Now, I don't know the full extent of it, but I know he certainly hit Scotland, which is where he was from. Mm -hmm. And all over the United States, there are Carnegie libraries. And our public library here is a Carnegie library, right? And so you started at a car Carnegie. I'll say it right. I did start at Carnegie library. Right. And um, my life and career ended at a Carnegie library. Yeah. So, so your first job was at a Carnegie library in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And so, and I inter interrupted you kind of halfway through that. So then what happened from there? So it was in Dumbarton and Dumbarton is the county seat or the county of Dumbarton Shire. And that was the library I first worked at. And I worked there, first of all, as a teenager, unpaid and then paid as a shelver. And I really liked that. And I kept doing shelving shifts as I went through high school. And I had a few other jobs as well, but those were really just for money. Those weren't ones that I loved. Like I worked in hardware stores as well. But it, I was drawn to doing that as a career. And so when the time eventually came when I finished high school and I went to college, that was a time for me to pursue a degree just for fun knowing that I would then eventually go on and do library school. So I went to Strathclyde University, got a degree in medieval history, because I liked that. Yeah. And then after that, went on and studied library science at Strathclyde. Okay. And so that was um, that was a really good thing for me. It reinforced the career. And at the same time, while I was doing that, I was also a reservist in the British Army. And that was partly because I felt it was the right thing to do. It was a tradition in my family, but also because it was a really good source of tax-free revenue <laughs> that helped with college expenses. Yeah. So, you know, I did I did that as well. Yeah. So then, kind of moving on, you went from, from going to the school to then being a librarian, right? For, for that's, you know, that's right. Okay. So... I had worked for the Dumbarton Shire system for quite a long time. But after college was finished, both parts, I was looking for a librarian position, one where you'd have to have the degree. And I was very lucky to get a job at Lanark Grammar School. And Lanark Grammar School is in a different county in Scotland, but it's not so far away from Dumbarton. It's in Lanark Shire. Okay. Lanark is the county seat of Lanark Shire. And Lanark Grammar School is a high school. So I became, in my late 20s, a middle school, formerly accredited librarian and worked there for three years as the media center librarian. And that was my first exposure to children's services. Oh, I already had a sort of a hankering to do that. Yeah. And so then I wanted to pursue that afterwards. Now... After working there for several years, the next thing that happened in my life's journey was I was actually supposed to get engaged to somebody in Scotland and our two families kind of didn't really like that idea very much. And a lot of influence was brought against us to have that not happen. And I won't dwell upon it too much, but there's a lot of sectarianism in my part of Scotland. And at least back in those days, the Protestant Catholics thing was still quite a, a, a strong issue. So that was really why that didn't work out. So I decided somewhat extravagantly, so kind of crazy, that I would move to America. Wow. And I thought I'd be moving to Australia. And, and, and there's there's no good right or reason for this. So this is one of these things that people just do sometimes, yeah. like, right? And it was really relatively easy in the late 90s to move to America. Um, the, the whole process was easy. Green cards were easy to come by. I came over here and very quickly found a job in librarianship here. Although it was not in public librarianship or school librarianship, it was doing archival work for a federal agency. It was a subcontractor job. Interesting, okay. And um, that... That wasn't bad, but it didn't really fuel my passion. Sure. You know, it was it was a job. It was the end of the nineties, things were booming and I liked it. But 
I was looking to get into public library work. So after doing that for a few years, I was at a job fair where I saw a job opening. This was a job fair in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I saw that there was a job opening at a public library, not that far away. And it was in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And Oak Ridge, Tennessee, um, which was on a federal reservation because of the science stuff that goes on there, had a really robust public library and good what public library program. And it was also connected to the Knoxville system. Okay. So I interviewed for that more based upon the work that I had done with my high school librarianship okay. and less on the government stuff. But it still worked out. And so I got the job there. And I was there for 10 years doing children's librarianship as Mr. Will, which because in, in that part of the South, they always call you Mr. and then your first name, not your surname. Interesting. Okay. So I became Mr. Will. And it was a full service youth service department, similar to the one we have here. I had a few staff. We had a great children's room. We did story time three times a week. And I really, really loved it. Now, of course, during this journey, I had got married and had kids, and the kids were little at this time. And so being little, they were also the perfect guinea pigs <laughs> to be my story time buddies. If I could try out everything on them, you know, anything that I was doing was available, you <laughs> could practice on them. Right. And I, and I really, really enjoyed that. And it was super fulfilling part of my life. And I still look back upon that as one of the really happiest parts of my life. But we felt that as the children got older, really that um, there was not as many educational opportunities there as there would be in other parts of the country. And East Tennessee, I'm not knocking it, is a great place when the kids were little. But as they got older, I wanted to see some live somewhere or have them see something with broader horizons. And so that prompted a look at coming over here to the West Coast. To look at that, I did some statistical research on what cities best funded their libraries. Sure, dear librarian. <laughs> I was looking, you know, did library bond measures pass? How how well did that work? And I looked at a few other livability metrics. And I kept coming up with the Portland area Maybe not necessarily the Multnomah library system, but I could see there were really robust library services here. There also were in San Francisco. There, there also were in some other cities in Seattle. But the cost of living was still at that time of somewhat affordable. We're talking about 2010, year then. So that kind of put me over the top on deciding on coming to this area. Okay. So when I got here, the next thing I did was I tried out with three different systems. I was I was in the on-call pool for Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington County systems. Just to kind of put my toe in the water, try and meet people, and see if I could get back into children's librarianship. Now, it kind of worked and it kind of didn't. So... I got a part-time position at Lake Oswego Public Library doing some children's service work on call. But when they had their big job opening, when the long-tenured children's librarian, Jacqueline Rose, retired, I didn't get the job. I came second. So, all went. And then I did get a job at Tuolas in Public Library, but it was working as a circulation supervisor not in children's services. So that was a good experience, yeah. but it wasn't really my main thing. Yeah. Did that for a year, and then there was a job opening, a garden home community library in children's services, went there and became Mr. Will again for a few years in garden home. And it was in the same system as Tualatin and Sherwood. All of those libraries are in the Washington County system. And... I thoroughly loved the Washington County library system. 
I think it was amazing. Of course, it's easy to be amazing when you're very highly resourced, right? <laughs> right. So they had lots of money for services and they did really good work with those services. So I guess that kind of rounded out my children's service years to about 15 years in children's service, mm-hmm. which was really great. And then the library director at Garden Home retired and the library board suggested very strongly that I should take up the role as the interim library director, which I which I then did. Okay. And after doing a lot of work and changing some things and creating some things, kind of really liking it, when they opened for the permanent position, I decided it was time to try for that. And sometimes I've I've kind of regretted that decision as well because I really like being a children's library, mm-hmm. but I also could see that there was a lot of things that were needing doing there, and I was under a lot of influence to do them. Yeah. So that led me to that. Okay. That journey. And then from there, I've been a library director ever since until recently. Okay. So then from there, you came to, you know, so how did you transfer from there to the, the new work of the library? So I was a library director at Garden Home for a couple of years, and then a library director at North Plains Public Library for a couple of years. And to be honest, looking to get back into a larger, what I would call a full service library. Because North Plains and Garden Home, both smashing, but they're very small and they don't offer all the services. Now, Newburg Public Library is very similar to Oak Ridge Public Library in Tennessee or the Carnegie Library back in the Bartonshire. It's a These are medium-sized, full-service libraries that have an adult desk and a children's desk and a children's department, an adult department, programming and services and story time. They do all of this stuff. And so I thought, if I'm going to be a library director, I would like to end up my career, finish out my career, as a library director of a library like that, mm-hmm. of the type of library that offers the whole enchilada without necessarily being too big. Yeah. And so that's why I applied. I didn't think I had a, a hope of getting the job here in Newburgh. I didn't know anyone from Yale County. No connections or anything. I just threw my hand in the ring. And I thought, well, if it doesn't work out, I know that the Oregon City Library will be looking for a director soon, and I'm going to probably get that one. So this was kind of a, a Hail Mary mission. And much to my surprise, I got the job. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I remember uh, what year might have that was 2019. Mm-hmm. Shortly after you were there, I remember being in the library. I was doing some work in there, and I, I hear this beautiful Scottish voice. And I remember kind of scooting closer. I was like, I, I want to listen to that that Scottish man. I, I just have always had a fascination. So I've always loved your accent. I'm sure you get that a lot because we don't have too many Scots around here. So I just remember that. It's like, oh, he seems like just an intelligent and philosophical man being a librarian and a Scotsman. So... That was my first experience. Um, I really, I think he's a librarian. He seems to kind of be telling people what to do. So um, now I'm going back to. <laughs> but, but, you know, made it really hard to order a cheeseburger in Tennessee. Can you imagine the, the, the collision of the two accents? <laughs> well, it's funny. I was born in Missouri. Uh, and so very familiar with the Southern accents. And it's, uh, yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> But anyway, so what are, what are some of the things that from the time you got to the library, I, I've heard some of the things and processes you put into place, but what would you say you're most, um, you're, you're most proud of accomplishing while you're the library? Beyond the shadow of a doubt, I am most proud of closing the library card desert as it was known. And I mean, known at the state level, there was an area all around Newburgh where nobody could get a library card without having to pay for it. Kind of defeats the purpose of it. Right. Library card in people's mind. Yeah. Right. So we'd have people coming in off the street who were from just a mile outside of the edge of the municipality, the edge of the boundary, 
or on the other house. <laughs> right. I think for a while we were like, this pine is like out of that side. Right. So can you imagine the frustration? <laughs> Okay, very easily. Members of the public would commit and we'd be like, um, so sorry, but because of this unusual arrangement that has historically happened here, we are unable to get into a card unless you pay for it. And but the kids got card. Right. The kids got card. Got... And that was an earlier bargain that had been struck. Really at the behest, partly of the state library, they were insistent that no matter what, the kids one would still have to happen. But you know, not pointing fingers, but it was a lot of negotiating between Shemekeda community, college, its boundary, the state, the way that this particular piece of real estate was not part of PCC. Mm -hmm. It was part of the other, you know, the, the other system. And so we ended up kind of in a, in a desert as well. Yeah. Because our revenue went to PCC. It didn't go to Shemekeda. Shemekeda was the fiscal agent for the library system for three counties. So the city of Newburgh paid in to allow us to have a library here, but that only extended to the edge of the municipality. Interesting. That's why we ended up with this corona of unservedness around us. Uh -huh. And so fixing that, was absolutely smashing. And I think so how did you do that? I just negotiated. Like I, I got into some chat with the state librarian, I connected the state librarian with the brand new executive director of the library service. And he was more willing to move on these points than the previous incumbent, a lot more reasonable man actually. Um sorry if you're hearing this, John. Um <laughs> the uh the new guy, Mr. Hunter, was willing to negotiate. The state librarian got involved. One of the other state librarians, Buzzy, got involved, Buzzy Nelson, who's a luminary library statewide. And we went round and round a few times and we kind of hammered out an agreement whereby the system would not charge us any extra money to make the basic cards that you can naturally get if you're in any of the other three counties. But we would still have to charge for full service cards. So okay. that was a compromise. In other words, they were leaving some revenue on the table, mm -hmm. but they were closing a huge wound of no library service, yeah. which this, the state library wanted that, had always wanted that, and so I just think it took an approach of getting people together, rounds of emailing. Of course, I tried, first of all, for the full service card for free. That didn't work. They said they would have to increase the charge that the city would have to pay. And that wouldn't be fair to the city because then city taxpayers would be covering people who are not in the city. Right. And so we eventually settled on, would it be reasonable? If we went with the basic card and they agreed, then I had to get it through council, which I did. Then I had to go through the CCRLS council and they had to vote to approve it, which they did. So we were able to overcome these obstacles. And I think he was just thinking outside of the box. Mm. Like, how could we do this somehow? Yeah. So what is the difference between a full service card and the basic level? So the basic card lets you have 10 items rather than a hundred items. Okay. And that's that's the primary difference. And that's pretty reasonable, in my opinion. Right. So the people who come in who are not paying any money whatsoever to CCI release or the city of Newburgh can still get ten items. And no one can read a hundred but well, I mean unless it's tiny children in the book, but you can't read a hundred books in a month. <laughs> yeah, and then show it to you sure it oh. does bring it back. Right, right. right. Sure. So so it, it it would avoid those unpleasant things that have been happening for 20 years, yeah. 20 years of turning people away. Yeah. Wow. So that was a big deal to me. Um, I also championed the cause of getting the infrastructure to the library modernized. We were on a radio-like bridge 
and I was able to a radio leak break. Yeah, instead of it, instead of being a fiber optic bundle connecting like the library, until I got here, there was literally a radio antenna on the roof. Oh my! Pointed up <laughs> back to City Hall, so trees would grow in the way. <laughs> um, all all the light wicked uh, cures would stop or see for a while. Oh, the wind, the like, wind, wow! Right. So, um, and with the new public works director, Russ Thomas, the great guy, easy to work with. I just suggested to him that this would be the time to do this. He was willing to look at that, use some of his contingency funds. This was before he was a save manager. Um, and we got that fixed. So that was another big thing. And the library has leaked for 20 years. And we're in the process right now of fixing that too. That also began before I was a city manager. And then... Probably the coolest thing I did in that short time was when we reorganized the nonfiction collection because we had to move over 20,000 items and we reorganized it in four and a half hours. And it's the only library operation I ever did in my life that went off flawlessly. Moving 20,000 items in four and a half hours flawlessly. With no fail. Not one handful of books ended up misplaced. Nothing was left over at the end. And that also included moving half of the furniture because there was an unloading phase. Then we had movers who had moved the furniture and then we reloaded the shelving. And the way I figured this out was I, I gamified it because I also do strategy game. Okay. So I used a Scrabble-like board where each counter represented one bay, one five or six foot section that could be moved by one team of people. That's two people, a volunteer and a staff member working together with one book card. Okay. And, a, and the control board was like a Scrabble board where there were all these little tiles who were in their beginning position. And that made that we only had to unload one range onto the floor. And then teams could come and get their next job sheet. And one job sheet represented one tile, which represented one bookcase, okay. which I called a B. Okay. And so all they had to do was to move one B flawlessly. And after they moved the bay into any open spot on the game board, the time would be moved when the mission was complete. Hmm. And then they would claim their next sheet and begin their next task. So I was able to have 22 teams of people working simultaneously with nobody standing around because everybody was working on moving just one bay yeah. to the next empty spot on the look. Wow. And I've still got the game board. If anyone no, else to see that. That's interesting. I like picture of that to, to see. And that sounds like a very tedious task that could, it sounds a little fun when you shift this kind of that way. Well, like it was, we played music and we jammed, yeah. we jammed out, we ate pizza and, and we just rocked it. Yeah. The thing about that was I'd been involved in several other library big moves in the past and they always went wrong, <laughs> including ones where I was involved as a supervisor. Yeah. I think when you can visualize it that way, I mean, that's, I never would have called that, but it makes sense. Well, I, I, in previous, for example, I was involved in a, a big one in Oak Ridge, moving a bunch of stuff, but we did it wrong. We didn't know we were doing it. Sure. Usually it seems to work that way. Right. It seems right. Right. So we, we would measure, we said with our measurements were right, and we'd completely unload the bookcases. Then we would move it all back into the new spots mm -hmm. and it didn't fit. And then we'd end up spending three days shifting everything around, right? Yeah. So the key piece of this was to think of it as a strategic problem. Yeah. How can I gamify this so that each module, which is a bay, goes to live in its new home? Yeah. And no one is moving anything else except to an empty spot. Yeah. Huh. That's fascinating. What else would you say... Was it Library of Things? Was that, was that your... It, no, that was Leah Griffith, the old director, started that. Okay. That was already going really well, and my hat off to her for getting that going. Yeah. So that wasn't me. 
And we did invent, and this is, might sound really boring to your listeners, but we did invent a cool double ledger system to double check our invoices with some Excel conditional formatting where the color of the bar would change to red if we were too close to being overspent on that line item. Okay. And we just did that in a bunch of Google Docs. Yeah. So that didn't exist till I got there. Apart from that, it was all kind of boring and ministry <laughs> things I did. But. Yeah. So, so how long were you librarian before everything started happening with the city manager position? So, as you know, we, we have had a lot of instability in that position. And... But where it became, where I became directly involved in it was towards the end of last year, at, at which point the city council was looking for somebody to step in in an interim role. And at that point, the mayor approached me and asked me if I was willing to take on that role. And... Um, under the condition that I was definitely allowed to come back to the library. Right. I agreed. So that that happened just before, it was like the end of October, the beginning. And you'd been with the library. I know there were a lot of closures and stuff with the pandemic. So you've been struggling with all that. And now, you know, that was kind of another wrench too, right? Yeah, the beginning of the pandemic, there was a bit of time when I was the only person in the building. Mm. Just cutting little bits of elastic to make masks for the mask force. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there'd been a lot of tumult and and craziness, and a lot of our long tenure staff decided it was time to retire during the pandemic, and that happened in all kinds of ways. Sure. So very chaotic, very chaotic, having to make lots of decisions quickly. Right. So then you stepped in as as temporary. At what time did you realize that it was, it w might not be temporary? So I was um, really reluctant to come to terms with that soul at first. Because it's really, it wasn't, it's not what my life's supposed to be about. But I had many, many people. And I'm not talking about managers or supervisors, I'm talking about rank and file staff came to visit me throughout those early months, thanking me for how things were going and asking if I would consider staying on permanently or applying to do so. Obviously, I still had to get the job if I did decide to apply. Right. That was a really hard decision for my wife and I to make. Obviously, I really liked my life the way it was. But the call to service from these people aimed at me was very clear. And we're not talking dozens of people. We're talking about probably about 40 staff came to see me out of 150 and directly said that to me. Or say this is this is things are going very well, and therefore, um, that was a, a strong influence on me to consider this. And I'd also created some things that were just very very needful that made me not want to made me want to see it through. Yeah, can you describe some of those things? Because at one point at the Chamber of Commerce, you share some of the things that you put into place, for example, how to maybe uh, eliminate or at least reduce some of the instability in this city manager position, because um, there have been several, right? And there is a, a process that was in place that maybe was not the best process to choose a city manager. Yeah. So, that, so that, that, I mean, there are some merits to the, the traditional recruiting method that's used. I mean, many cities use a traditional method. They, they'll they'll have a recruiter and they'll bring in a panel and the panel will be interviewed or perhaps there'll be a town hall event. These are some of the normal ways that this happens. But I really felt strongly that perhaps we should try something different. And so what I thought we would do is I proposed to have a uniform hiring policy for all staff at all levels 
no matter whether it was the city manager or even a senior planner or all the way through the rank and file to somebody that was just summer summer help or something, right? A shelver or somebody who's a utility worker entering in at the bottom level. And I don't see bottom with prejudice because those guys really work their ass off. That process was a scored process. I wanted to use features of the NeoGov platform. NeoGov is software that can be used for, rec for recruiting purposes. And have a scoring system, and a scoring system where each person putting the scores in would, would be double blinded from all the other scores. So they wouldn't know what the other uh, panelists were voting. Yeah. They wouldn't know what the scores would be. And the scoring would have to be over the 70th percentile for the candidate to move forward to the next stage. Okay. And the finalist in every case will be the person who scored the highest and who also scored higher than 70%. Okay. So that would make the system crystal fair, crystal clear. Right. And so I implemented that and I advocated to the council that they should use the same methodology for the city manager recruitment. And that was entirely up to them because council decides that position. Yeah. They decide the judge, they decide the city manager, and there's only a few positions like that. It's yeah. tied up to them. And so they accepted this recommendation when the time came to hire the city manager to use that system. Okay. And, and that's what happened. <laughs> right. So... In the case of that position, there were some additional checks and balances added. The city attorney was involved in verifying the scores. Sure. In, in, the, in the impossible case, Alison in HR would do anything wrong, which she never would. She's a person of the highest ethical value. That would add an extra layer of yeah. surety to that. And you added some other checks and balances. For example, if, if there was a position where someone bought a, a complaint, you changed who complaint would, would go to to ensure that it was listened to, correct? Correct. So the normal process in, a, in, in most city governments is that there's a complaint that would go to the HR department if, if a staff member was believed to be doing something inappropriate or incorrect. And that works very well for most situations. But where it can be difficult is if it's uh, the department head or somebody very senior, that would be a challenge perhaps for HR to be dealing with somebody who was in a very real sense their peer or perhaps even their superior in the chain of command. So to get around that problem, I added the STRIVE Committee. And the STRIVE Committee has the function of taking complaints that would be aimed at people who were department heads or and they would take those complaints and their duty is to forward them on directly to the mayor and to the head of HR at the same time. Okay. So it's a, a dual reporting mechanism. And also that was set up with a charter that the stride committee could not be disbanded by the city manager. Without the stride committee reporting to the mayor that the city manager is disbanding it. Interesting. Okay. So it's not something that can be removed. If if I should, you know, retire one day. Mm -hmm. Or have you said, hey, I want to start doing some things that are unethical. We can't just I can't you know, move your yo. Yeah. And 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 the people who staff that committee are the number two people in this is critical. They're not the department heads. They're the number two person in each section. So it's a police captain, not the police chief. Right. It's the head of the building division, not the planning director. And it's that way for all those positions. So that means they're close enough to hear the rumors and they're high enough up to have the experience and the, the leadership skill to make the report. You know, it's interesting hearing you talk about this. When I first heard you talk, I, I was just kind of blown away by the level of, you mentioned earlier, just with gamifying, moving all these books and having a Scrabble type board and just your ability to think outside the box. And um, I mean, I think there's just so much 
wisdom there, whether you call it a gift or just over time, a, a talent that has kind of accrued, but really the strategic gaming side of you fits very well into a city manager position because you're able to take really complex problems that most people just say, well, this is the way it is. Um, and you've been able to find some pretty innovative solutions, which I just think is fascinating. And I'm sure there's a lot of other things, um, that you've done as well. So one of the things I was curious about, and, and many people have asked me about this as they've heard about this interview as well, you know, the city, you know, they, they're doing all this building and they're sitting on all this tax funds and you know, they, what are they doing with all the money that they get? So, <laughs> you know, I think I'm just some level of not fully understanding how a city runs, the expense, expenses involved. For example, the SDC charges, um, which are the system development charges that go into a uh, building that are much higher than many people would prefer, but there's kind of some, uh, you know, cash 22 with it. Every action, there's a certain response or, or reaction or a consequence to that, that can make something that to the public might seem like, well, they should just do this, but it's usually not that easy. So what are some of the things like that, that you kind of had to work through and think through? Right. Well, well, one of the things is that for many years, it was believed in the city that we had a structural deficit. And this was one of the things that was talked about in budget meetings for, for many cycles. But when we came to analyze the budget, when I arrived, and very much gifted by having an amazing finance officer in the person of Katie Strode, who is literally brilliant. And she really dug deeply into her budget. And she had arrived just a, half a year before me in, in this role, I mean. She's only been with the city now for, I believe, eight or nine months. She really dug into this and she discovered that using three different measuring systems, there was no structural deficit problem facing the city. Mm. And so the city's financial risks, because in any organization there were always risks, those are tied to some tangible things that we need to work about worry about it and work on one of those being the need to build a water plant so we have to build a new water plant we it's it's a state mandated rule the water plant we currently have is not going to be sufficient for our needs and that's going to be 12 to 14 million dollars that's a lot of money we have to worry about that we have to worry about retirement costs increasing we have to be careful to keep good fund balances to mitigate against those uncertain threats that lie on the, on the horizon. But in the short term, in the next two to three years, our fiscal position was actually far stronger than people had believed it to be when we looked at it more closely. Our ending fund balances were good. There's one fund which is declining, which is the roads funds, but that's because of gasoline revenue, which is a state revenue line item, which is diminishing because ironically of more fuel efficient vehicles. <laughs> so that's one where the state has to figure out something new on how it's going to deal with EVs. Yeah. And, and well, there's got to be some new system. Yeah. Because EVs still wear out roads, right. even though they don't use gasoline. And the state passes that money straight through into our roads fund. And that's the one that's going down right now. So we're going to have to come up with new revenue sources to backfill that loss if the state doesn't come up with some kind of solution yeah. in the near future. And I, I hope they're working on that diligently. Yeah. Well, the from the real estate side of things, that's something, you know, that's kind of my my career, what my focus is off on. Uh, okay, well, we have this affordable housing crisis. It costs so much with the permitting and the fees and all this to to build a house, we want affordable housing, yet it's often cost prohibitive. Then there's other reasons for that too, but you can't just take away the fees, right? You should just make it simpler because then the other things don't get paid for. So, right. You, like like to, to, to pick a project, right? If you look at a road project like um, Elliot Road, to name one, that costs several millions of dollars to do that one piece of road. When you now, I'm certainly not in the engineering division, but one thing I have learned very quickly is the time to fix the infrastructure is when you lift the road. 
when you're replacing the road, that's the time to get it because it's cheaper to upgrade those pipes and do those necessary things when you've already taken off the road surface. Right. So every time we do something like that, it costs two or three million dollars. That has to be paid for partly from S pardon me, partly from SDCs, partly from our general funds. So there are always going to be these expenses. And people say, oh, well, why has the city got all this money? Well, the city does not have all this money. The city has discrete funds. Each fund is for a specific purpose. And at the moment, the fund balances are healthy, which is exactly where the residents should want them to be. And what, what would happen if they weren't? So say, for example, they, the city councilor, is that the city council's decision who would decide the SDC said, hey, we're going to cut these in half. What would happen? Well, then it would be very simple. You wouldn't have the revenue to do road maintenance, repairs, or other projects. Or worse, and I'm not going to name the city that I'm thinking about right now. There's a city not far from here, another medium-sized city that has experienced over the last 10 years periods of boom and bust where they've had to lay off people and then hire them back because they've had an oscillating budget pattern. And we don't want to do that. When you have to lay off staff, you never get that skill back, albeit very slowly. So it is better for us to have a stable and fiscally conservative approach to the whole problem. Yeah. And one of the things I introduced this year was a budget request form and the budget request form had to be filled out by department heads to justify any shift in any line item in an upward or downward direction because I encourage them to think creatively about reducing some of the funds if they could. Those budget request forms were the first part of building the budget that we're running on right now. And that meant that every line item in the city was looked at in January. Every single line item. And those bundles of fillable PDFs were used to develop the line item numbers in the current budget. And so I can say very confidently that the whole assemblage has been inspected very carefully this year. And it's a very conservative package. Yeah. I've actually had to lay a few folk off because um, despite their their value in some areas, I felt that given the risks that the city has in the more medium term, I didn't need those stuff. And that was hard. There were also some positions that were open when I arrived and I cancelled them. To be specific, there was an assistant city manager position that was supposed to be filled, which would have made my life a lot easier because I would have effectively halved my workload. I immediately cancelled that position. And that alone saved over $100,000 in the budget. So through some cost cutting in these areas, I've saved about $600,000 just in direct labour. And one of the things I appreciate in the Hattopra, how many people who just see, oh, there's just, you know, there's a new city winner or whatever, but uh, you lead from the front. You're, you're not afraid to do the dirty work. You're not afraid. I mean, just like with that example, you took on more work for yourself and you, I think you did a good job leading by example. And I, I think that having your position lead the way you do, I think really is infectious. And that's probably why the rest of the stat wanted you to stay on. Because they saw that, I imagine it's very inspiring for everyone else. So I appreciate that. And I know we're kind of short on time here, but this is an important story in my mind, I think, for our our town to hear about, to know some of the story behind uh, where you are now. Um, what is your connection still to the library? I know there's still probably a very strong heartfelt connection is always going to have a special place in your heart. Are you able to have any involvement with the library still? Well, sometimes, um, well, actually there's this kind of two parts to this. The first is I'm trying very hard not to mow the grass 
of Corey Burkle, who is the current acting library director and who I don't want to... I'm not a micromanager. If I get too involved in library matters, I'm, I'm taking away from her chance to do brilliant things, which she is doing. But I do go over there sometimes just to get a recharge. So there's times when I'll go in there and just go in the back room for a minute and have a little emotional recharge or something. Yeah. Because it is a happy place. And it's a really good thing. And it's a culturally important thing. You can't have a successful city that doesn't have a successful library. That's just my opinion. Yeah. As it should be. <laughs> you know, it's something that I... it's. I, I love reading business books, love reading um, self-improvement books, but it can be cost prohibitive at times to buy each one. So I finally, wow, look, I wouldn't find them and said, oh, well, you can actually request books. So I began doing that and, and I saved a lot of money. I get right in the margins and everything like I, I used to, but, um, you know, it's, I think having a library is something that we, we take for granted, the ability to have knowledge for free. Um, in a way that the internet really just can't provide, in my opinion. Everyone thought you probably were surrounded by this. People saying, oh, you know, with the internet, people won't read books anymore, but I don't think books are gone anywhere. There's the Kindle. I don't care if it's a Kindle. I don't care if it's a blog. There's no that really replaces a paper book in your hand. Well, I hope you spend more time at the library um, and are able to do that because I think for the, this, I mean, really it is a sacrifice that you made. Um, I think you rose to the call I was reminded by, uh, there's a Batman quote of, you know, not the, yeah, uh, not, you're not the hero we deserve, but the hero we need right now. And, uh, you know, I think that was kind of true that for whatever reason there. Well, I don't think I'm, I think I'm anybody's hero. I well, I had 40 people from, uh, the city that thought you were <laughs> and, and more so because you got the job and, you know, but, but I think just that willingness to say, okay, I'm willing to lay down what I'm really passionate about to do, what is really for, for the greater good. You were for better or worse in your mind, the best person for the job. And you, you filled that and you rose to the occasion. Um, and I don't view that lightly. I know a lot of people don't. And I think it's just important to, to recognize and honor the sacrifice that you made, that your heart's calling of what you finally felt was where you could be to, to, to be in a place that's not your passion, but that you were, making many lives better. I think you really made our, our town a better place to be. Well, I'm going to do my best. I I didn't like the job, but I'm going to keep doing it. And that's it. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Will, for sharing your story. Um, and I hope one day you're able to, to come back <laughs> and really enjoy being Mr. Will again. Um, Maybe if you get that uh, assistant city manager role, you can come back to the library as a, whether as a volunteer or a you know assistant library director, whatever it might be. Uh, we appreciate you having here. I think you add a lot of the life and energy uh, to the city, and uh, I know you're very much appreciated. So thank you for sharing your story, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the town hearing hearing more about Mr. Will. Thanks, mate. Thank you for listening to this episode, and I hope you enjoyed hearing Will's story. We really are fortunate to have someone like Will as our city manager, and I think it's important to know really what he gave up to be here. Well, I think we have a bright future ahead of us, and if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more stories like this one, you can subscribe to this podcast using your favorite podcast app. Well, thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you in the next episode.